G'day, Mark Pesci here. We're going to talk about the metaverse. Now, the metaverse may sound like a very new idea. Most people will have only heard of it in the last few years, particularly around the transformation of Facebook into meta. The history of the metaverse actually goes back a lot further, particularly in fiction. And one of the very first evocations of the metaverse is in a short story by Ian Forster called The Machine Stops. And Forster manages to completely encapsulate the fact that Human beings would be living in a radically connected world electronically, and yet at the same time in a radically separate world where people would not necessarily be meeting face to face. And there was this tension between the connectivity and the demands of connectivity. He even explores FOMO in here. And at the same time, the alienation that is brought about by technology. And so this is an early one, more than 100 years old, but starts to nail down how we feel about these extremely connected spaces that today we call the metaverse. You come forward to the 1950s in the Saturday Evening Post in America. That is the highest rated magazine, most published magazine at the time. Ray Bradbury has a short story called The Belt, which talks about a virtual reality environment, actually a projected environment that people can be inside together that is following the dictates of some children with perhaps some psychological issues around their parents. And they turn the room into a weapon against their parents. And this, again, is taking a look at the whole nature of what happens inside these virtual environments that in fact the things that are inside of us our psychologies can be projected into these environments and then shared again one of the things that we're now incredibly conscious of as we're working together in large groups we're finding that people are acting out in specific ways around their beliefs now the example where most people would sort of mark the beginning of the idea of the modern metaverse is William Gibson's novel, Neuromancer, which gives us the word cyberspace. And cyberspace is still a word that we use today. We prefix a lot of things with cyber because of the word cyberspace in this book. Gibson cyberspace basically spanned all of the computer systems, all of the corporate data networks, all of the machine and military systems. And although it was all there, it still kind of felt rather empty. And that's one of the most interesting things about his cyberspace is, yes, everything is connected in it, but the people in it are really separate, really far apart. There aren't many people in it, maybe some hackers doing some work, but that's it. But it was still a profound evocation of what would happen when you had massive connectivity. This book is written in 1984, so just at the beginning of the age of the personal computer and really at the very beginning of the Internet. Now, just after that and inspired more by some short stories that came before it by Werner Vinge than by Neuromancer. A group at Lucasfilm, so this is the games division of Lucas, and Lucas is rolling in money from the Star Wars films at this time, starts a games division. They create a title for the Commodore 64, so one of the very first generation of PCs, not a very powerful machine, but this machine was being marketed to people who could afford a $399 computer and could afford a modem because, in fact, they had someone offering a connectivity service. And it was available in the evening, used for corporate stuff during the day. But in the evening, they wanted consumers to dial into it. And so the programmers, and this is Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar, who are the two leads on this, they created the very first interactive multi-user virtual environment which they called Habitat. And Habitat was, as much as anything else, an experiment. It had been designed by them as a series of rooms. There would be puzzles to solve in the room. People would be able to meet in those rooms, solve the puzzles together, go on to other rooms. What they found was that people would solve a puzzle very quickly and then immediately share the solution to the puzzle with everyone else in the network. And so while they thought this was actually going to be a game-playing environment and they were going to generate all these puzzles for people to solve, in fact, what it was, it quickly became a social environment. People would go and hang out. And then as the system evolved and they gave people the tools to be able to build their own environments within the system that could then be shared with the other people in the system, it became an enormous creative endeavor as people were working with one another or competing with one another to create the most interesting environments within Habitat. And here, this quote from a paper, and you need to read this paper, it's easily accessible on the internet, just Google the title, The Lessons of Lucasfilm's Habitat. The essential lesson that we have abstracted from our experiences with Habitat is that a cyberspace is defined more by the interactions among the actors within it than by the technology with which it is implemented. And that is a statement about the metaverse that remains true. Now, the actual modern use of the word metaverse comes from another science fiction novel 
named Snow Crash. And Snow Crash basically posits now what we would think of as a true metaverse, which is not just a connected space of all of the computers and all of the people, or, or rather, not just all the computers, but now it's a connected space of all the people. So there are billions of simultaneously connected people inside the metaverse, all of them gathered around this central arcade area called The Street, where they're all processing in their own virtual forms. And the word avatar in its modern use as a virtual representation of yourself in the cyberspace, in the metaverse, that also comes from this book. So you can think of science fiction as being, in a sense, the prototyping format for the metaverse, and that most of the features we now think of as being key features to the metaverse emerged in science fiction all the way back 100 years, all the way into the present. Now, at this point, we actually make a transition where Snow Crash is actually seen almost as a design guise. And so Snow Crash is published in 1992. And by 1993 and 1994, you start to get the World Wide Web as a medium for people to be able to connect and to create and to create in new media. So you have the Web 1.0 era, which goes for about a decade, and you have basic functionality for the metaverse. One of the first examples was something called the Palace. Uh, it was done by some folks who were working at Time Warner. The Palace has two-dimensional avatars, but it has a large number of them that can gather together to talk. So you can have even hundreds or thousands. It was using a distributed server analogy. So you could log on to someone's server, talk to the people there, and then log on to another one. So there was a loose affiliation. And it created this first environment where someone could have a single avatar and move between all of these systems, talk to all of these different people. But it's two-dimensional. So while it's actually nailing part of it, which is that you're bringing people together in conversation in a social environment, you're not bringing them together within a world. For that to happen, took another technology. The technology is the virtual reality modeling language that was co-invented by myself and Tony Parisi back in February of 1994. And it quickly became the standard for 3D on the World Wide Web. And of course, Tony and I were explicitly you can tell from the papers that we wrote at the time, trying to create a format that could support cyberspace, that could support hundreds, thousands, millions of simultaneous people being inside a space communicating together. And very soon, people used VRML in that way. So you would have, for example, uh, Black Sun, which is a company out of Germany, creating multi-user virtual worlds, All Virtual, which is a company out of Iceland. So you saw many different systems being built using VRML to create shared environments for people to interact. Now, in the systems of the time, you could run these on your normal PC, normal modem, but they were all going into a central server that was basically arbitrating all of the communication between all of the people in the system. That becomes a bit of a choke point because once you have a large enough number of people, and that varies, if, even if you have a very fast computer, though somewhere beyond 100 people, it starts to get very hard to mediate all of the communications and all of the interactions between all of the people in these systems. And so these systems have a natural ceiling for how many people they can support simultaneously. But as experimental environments for people to learn what was possible in the metaverse, they actually did work quite well. All right, now we go into the Web 2.0 era. So this is the Web of everyone being connected and everything being connected. In other words, the web has succeeded at its task to connect everyone and everything. And now there's a new generation of metaverse tools and ways of thinking about the metaverse that actually tap into that. All right, and, and sort of the first two that you can think of now is Second Life. Second Life is a metaverse tool. It was inspired by VRML, but it's not built on VRML, but it was inspired by it. So it creates a, a platform and an environment for many people to come in and to use it in 3D and to chat and to socialize. This is the first bit of the metaverse that really got any big press. And in fact, it had some very big folks in it. IBM was in it, I think Oracle and, and Intel. Other companies had set up areas that were essentially permanent trade show booths in it. And there were just lots of people hanging out and creating things and sharing what they were creating in Second Life. 
Now, at exactly the same moment in time, you get the launch of Friendster. And Friendster is the basically the first of what we would think of as a modern social network. And a modern social network means that you are establishing a set of connections and then using that set of connections to distribute your updates, whether there's something you're sharing or something you're feeling or a photo you've taken. So this begins with Friendster. So you have this idea on one hand that you're having this social world, that is Second Life, and on the other hand that you're having this social graph inside Friendster. Now, in 2006, we get to Twitter. And Twitter is different from anything that has gone before it because in Twitter, at least potentially, everyone is simultaneously connected to everyone else. So it is possible to have a direct many-to-many -many connection where one person is speaking to billions. But it's not just that. It's billions speaking to billions simultaneously. And at the level of text, that is as close as we have been able to become to something that would be a metaverse in the sense of billions of simultaneous users putting any sort of interface on it beyond text, that is still proving to be a problem. But I think we can establish that Twitter has done at least the communication of many to many correctly and would qualify as a social metaverse in that respect. Now, here's the thing. All of the first generation virtual reality systems, which were either very, very expensive or really didn't work very well. Now, none of them got to the scale that they needed to be able to sustain commercial viability. And by 2007, what we would think of as virtual reality, at least at that point in time, was basically non-existent. There were some, a few military applications, probably a few medical applications, and, and that was basically it. And VR and the metaverse are popularly believed to be two sides of the same coin, that if you have VR, you'll have a metaverse. If you have a metaverse, you're gonna need VR. And so, in a sense, the metaverse disappeared when VR went down. But in fact, it didn't disappear. It simply moved into a new area to colonize. So now we actually get to the Web 3 era, where we actually are working hard at building the kinds of systems that we could call metaversal. And the first examples that we see of those are what we call open world games. And the first modern open world game is Grand Theft Auto. And when I say an open world game, I mean that you are in there as a player, but you aren't really particularly on a particular track as a player. You can do whatever you want. You know, you can go around and you can rob people and beat people up, or you can go around and rescue puppies and give people money and so on and so on and so forth. So in the sense that it's open, it's got a very large playing environment, but it's also you as a player can act as you want. You get to other modern systems, such as Fortnite. Again, more or less an open world, a battle royale system, but of course now one that also includes many other simultaneous online players. Now, Fortnite, although there are thousands or tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of people playing Fortnite at any moment in time, because it is a very popular game, Every battle royale is still restricted to a few hundred people because, again, as I said before, orchestrating the number of interactions between a large number of users becomes essentially an exponential scale problem very quickly. And so what they do is, the technical term, term is shard, they break the users up into their own little islands and there's battles happening on each little island. And each of those battles are happening with a small enough number of users that the systems behind it can actually keep up with that for all of the users. So it is a metaverse. But again, it is still kind of trapped by scale. And the scaling problem in the metaverse is not something that's easy to solve. You also now start to get, because it's Web3 and because you now have cryptocurrencies and NFTs and all of these things, you start to get private property metaverses. And Decentraland is basically the, the category example for that, where they had a token. So basically a piece of cryptocurrency that you could use to purchase land inside Decentraland. And you would have essentially your token would then be your certificate of ownership of that piece of land. So it was like having a deed to a piece of property. And they sold a lot of land. And they did their best to make this land valuable by zoning in a particular way so that retail outlets such as Nike would own a piece here. Or if you were poor and you just wanted a piece of land in town, you'd have it over here. And they established an aftermarket so that people could buy and sell property. And, you know, during the metaverse boom, particularly in 2021, people made a lot of money selling Decentraland 
rental end, most of those prices have collapsed. But you can see that people are trying to take some of the rules of the real world and apply them to the metaverse. Problem, of course, being that in the metaverse, land should simply be freely available, right? There should be no practical limit to how much land or where that land is. But by artificial scarcity, they can demand specific prices for land. Whether or not that actually works, well, we'll see in the future. And then you get the idea of the proprietary metaverse. Now, back in 2014, Mark Zuckerberg bought a company called Oculus from Palmer Luckey. And that was his first foray into what he was seeing as virtual and augmented realities being one of the futures for Facebook. And he started a whole team called Reality Labs that started to work on applications to exploit not just the hardware technology of virtual reality, so you get the Oculus Rift, the modern versions of that, but also applications that would be social applications. So in some sense, the equivalents of Facebook, but inside virtual reality. And they created an application called Horizon Worlds, which is a proprietary application. It is Facebook's or Meta's virtual world application. It's designed to be a space to work and play. And it has had some teething problems because it doesn't for most people, most of the time, feel like a good fit on either of those points. And a recent New York Times article described it basically as a wasteland. People come once, they check it out, and then they never return. So the idea of a proprietary metaverse, rather than something that's being open to billions of people simultaneously, and in that sense truly open, hasn't seemed to have caught on, despite billions of dollars being spent. And again, Mark Zuckerberg has been the man of the moment around all social media since Facebook was started in 2007. And in 2020, 2021, he was under enormous pressure around his business practices and how he was shaping Facebook to become an engine of dissatisfaction because that drove viewership. And that means that that drove up his advertising revenue. And when he was really at the peak of the criticism for all of this, he suddenly, basically out of the blue, decided that he was going to change the name of his company so that it's no longer Facebook. It's now Meta because Facebook Meta was going to become a metaverse first company. In the two years since that transformation, it hasn't gone well. And in fact, in the last quarter, Facebook Meta lost almost $10 billion in revenues from costs associated with Reality Labs. So they are investing huge amounts of money in the metaverse, and they haven't really produced anything to be able to show for it. And this is now scaring the rest of the market away from doing anything in the metaverse because they say, well, if Facebook with all of its resources can't do this, can anyone do this? Well, the next place that we're going we think, is rather than fully immersive virtual reality, it is in fact with augmented reality. So things that look like spectacles that are see-through that overlay a data-driven world, a metaverse, into the real world so that they are freely interchanging with one another. That sounds wonderful, but making it is very hard. Microsoft actually got there first with their HoloLens. And you can see the HoloLens. I think that's the second generation HoloLens on the top. What we're really looking for is something that looks more like a set of spectacles, as you see on the bottom. Apple and Meta have been, again, pouring billions of dollars into this. Both of these projects have been rumored and are rumored to be more and more and more delayed. At last rumor, Apple didn't think they were going to have anything until 2026, 2027. Uh, Meta has basically stopped talking about it. So we don't actually know if we're going to have an interface to the metaverse that will work well at least at any point in the future. Most people do not want to be fully immersed in a virtual reality headset. That is too big an ask for most people in most applications most of the time. People will be perfectly willing to don a pair of spectacles and use those either task dependent or while they're out in the world doing something. But getting to those spectacles is still a distance away in the future. And this means that really all we have with the metaverse now are a big set of questions. We know what we want, which is a simultaneously connected space with billions of people. We have that in the real world, although it is bounded by proximity. Now we're trying to erase proximity with technology. Can we do that? Well, 
It's really hard to know. But the thing you need to remember, the thing that has never changed, is the first thing that we learned when we started building the metaverse. The interactions among the actors, that's the thing that is more important than the technology. It's the people, stupid, and it always is. So if you focus on that, and if you think about the metaverse as a space for people and not a space where technology happens, then you're liable to find your way to something that works. Thank you.